Here are a few things I've collected over the years. There's a seagull on the Jersey coast who frequents a beach also frequented by couples who go there to park. This bird circles high overhead and drops clams on the tops of automobiles in order to break the shells. It never drops a clam on a convertible, just solid top cars. Almost always, the car on which the clam has been dropped can be seen to immediately move away. A larger number of women than men attempt suicide, but men outnumber women by more than three to one in successful efforts. It seems that women don't really want to destroy themselves, but rather draw attention to their ills or grievances. Women are the beneficiaries of 80% of all life insurance in force in the country. They also receive 71% of the total estates left by men and 64% of the estates left by women. A woman has written that when a man looks a woman straight in the eyes, she'd better do something about her figure. And a woman is perturbed by what a man forgets. A man is perturbed by what a woman remembers. And did you know that a psychoanalytical study has come up with a discovery that the majority of women hate men? It is believed that this hatred is so deep-rooted and is of such long-standing that most women aren't even aware of it. But the cause of the whole thing, the authorities agree, has its basic cause in woman's resentment of a male-dominated world which in turn is founded on the mistaken notion that men are supposed to be endowed with qualities which make them superior to women. The facts prove that this line of thinking is just so much hot air, but for centuries, men forced this belief upon the women who were helpless physically to resist. It's the old story of might makes right. Men subjugated women because they were physically smaller and weaker, and in that day and age, physical strength rather than brains held the balance of power. Alfred Adler, the famous psychologist, points out that this crazy concept that men were supposed to be superior to women causes such extreme tension between the sexes as to seriously jeopardize any really happy relationship between a man and a woman. But if the woman realizes why she has these deep-rooted feelings toward men in general, she can usually overcome the situation and live happily with her man anyway. This is especially true if she's married to a man with some sense who realizes that differences between human beings do not indicate superiority or inferiority. They're simply differences. The wise woman realizes that it's ridiculous to blame her husband for the conduct of other men at other times in history. Her husband can be an honest man even if his grandfather was a horse thief. But the old deluded dogma of male superiority has been rammed down women's throat until she just naturally chokes up with rage. And, as they say, this has been going on since way before the beginning of civilization. I used to wonder why women in general show so little courtesy to men. This must be the reason. They don't like us, and they can't be blamed for it. As our civilization progresses, perhaps gradually we can get rid of women's ancient animosity toward anything wearing pants. We no longer think you're inferior, ladies, nor superior. Here's a question for you. If you had your life to live over, at least that part of it you've lived, would you do the same as you've done, or would you live it differently? Now, I don't mean the little things so much, but rather the big important things. It's a big question, and according to a survey, a third of the women would do differently if they could live their lives over again, and better than half the men would have chosen some other line to follow. Now, at first glance, it appears that women are a lot smarter than men in making the major decisions that affect their lives, but that's not the whole story. Men have a much wider choice as to careers than women. You can say that women have exactly the same choice, but it doesn't work out that way. You don't find many women piloting commercial aircraft or ships at sea or playing center for the Chicago Bears or second base for the Yankees. Most women consider their careers to be marriage, children, and a home, and it's a big enough career for anyone. Psychologists point out, for instance, that great numbers of young people every year give up their dreams for particular careers because love comes along. Now, in a way, this seems to be a victory for the woman in that she has achieved the career of her choice, while her husband has had to give up his. But the facts seem to point out that it's a pyrrhic victory, and while the cost is deferred, it's nonetheless there and must one day be paid. Psychologists say that after the honeymoon's over and the young couple begin to stare life in the face, economics enters the picture. And this is one of the major reasons why more than half of the men surveyed indicated that they would have done differently if they could live their lives over again. They did not mean they would not have married their present wives necessarily, although I'm sure there were, were a sprinkling of these, but rather that they would have waited until they got on course before they married. Most of them, in a few years, wish they'd stuck to their original career decisions. They see then, although it seems they can't at the time of their mistake, that they could have had the career of which they'd planned and dreamed and the woman to whom they married. They could have had both. 
but they foolishly gave up one in favor of the other. They quit too soon. Economy is the great modifier of romance, and the girl is very wise who tells her young man to finish his preparation for his career before they marry. If their love is real and strong, it can stand the test of time. Time will only deepen it. If it's not the real thing, waiting will expose its flaws to the benefit of both of them. She will have a much better life, a contented husband, a better place in the community, and very probably more money to spend if she'll concentrate less on victory and more on a peaceful alliance. Occasionally, this picture is reversed, and then the man should be content to wait. A man needs a career outside of his home as well as a wife and children. Young women should remember this and get their starry-eyed young man back on the right track. I have an office in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where I now do most of my writing. It's near a large, popular marina. And during the hour I take off for lunch, I enjoy walking about the marina in the sunshine and seeing what new boats have shown up. The other day, an interesting steel schooner of about 60 feet came in as I stood near the fuel dock. She had obviously been on a long voyage and was from out of the country, as her yellow quarantine pennant signified. I struck up a conversation with one of her three young crew members and learned they were British. They had sailed the schooner from England, first visiting Scandinavia and the North Sea, then down the coast of Europe to the Canary Islands, and from there to the West Indies, where they'd spent three months island hopping, scuba diving, fishing, and just enjoying themselves. One is a dentist, one an engineer, and the third, who owns the schooner, is a university graduate who, who is simply looking for adventure. They're all still in their twenties, in great shape from their months at sea, and delightful and interesting young men. My wife and I have had them over for cocktails and dinner and introduced them to a few people in the area. Everyone to whom we've talked about them agrees with us that these young men are doing something more young people should do. They're devoting a year or two to travel and adventure and to getting their heads on straight before entering their careers. Most young people go from school directly into their careers, from one institution right into another, with no breathing and thinking time in between. Now our young English friends are working and saving enough money to continue their cruise. They hope eventually to work their way around the world. And the dentist and engineer are thinking seriously of settling in the United States when their odyssey has ended. Here's an interesting fact, talking about cruising around the world. Of all the water on Earth, less than 1% of it can be used for human and animal consumption. Of this 1%, about 26% of it is found in the United States. 97.2% of all the water on Earth is salt water and found in the great oceans and seas. Now, this leaves only 2.8% that's drinkable, and most of this amount is in glacial ice, which we can't use, at Greenland and the South Pole. The Antarctic ice sheet, the heavy layer of ice covering the South Pole, represents some 90% of all existing ice in the world, and on the average is a mile thick. It's all fresh water, of course, since the great ice cap averages about 6,000 feet above sea level. At the South Pole, the ice is 9,200 feet above sea level. In at least one region, the ice is 14,000 feet thick and rests on land far below sea level. Most of the world's fresh water supply, frozen stiff on the great continent of Antarctica and on Greenland, the world's largest island. Greenland is 50 times larger than the country that owns it, Denmark, about a fourth the size of the United States. 85% of it is covered in perpetual ice up to 10,000 feet thick. It isn't green at all. It was called Greenland as an advertising come-on for settlers sort of like selling waterfront lots in Tierra del Fuego. Emerson wrote, Nature magically suits the man to his fortunes, making these the fruit of his character. You have only to hold an apple in your hand to know that it came from an apple tree. It could not have come from any other kind of tree on earth, for we know the tree by its fruit, and you can tell a lot about a person by his fortunes, because, as Emerson said, they are the fruit of his character, and they are represented by his environment, what he has, what he is, what he does. But most people seem to believe not that their fortunes are only the reflection of what they are, but rather that they are the reflection of their fortunes, and thus they often domesticate themselves to live in an environment and under conditions which they do not like or enjoy because they feel there's no escape. My daughter used to ride in horse shows until she discovered boys are more interesting than horses, and while this is in many cases debatable, it often brought to mind an interesting parallel. Between horse show events, I used to hold and walk her horse for her. He was a magnificent thoroughbred hunter, alive with nervous energy and tremendous power. With one hand, I kept his nearly 
one thousand pounds under control as he slobbered down my sleeve, just as my little girl did when she took him over the jumps. The thing was that he didn't know his power, nor that he could be free of either of us. He was controlled by our minds, certainly not by our strength, just as we control all the animals of the earth. And like the horse, millions, perhaps, are daily led through their paces by an environment of their own creation, never suspecting that they themselves have fashioned the halter and the lead by going along with it. That its strength lies solely in their thinking it controls them. And because they do not understand this, they are held as prisoners of themselves. Spinoza said, To understand something is to be delivered of it. So then it is not their circumstances which control them, it is their lack of understanding that their fortunes are the fruit of their characters. Are you familiar with Buddha's Eightfold Path? Very little is known by most people in the Western world about this great man who lived 560 years before the birth of Christ. He taught for 45 years. Like so many great teachers, he wrote not a word, and more than a hundred years followed his death before the first written records appeared. But let me see if I can give you his eight steps for enlightenment, what we might call happiness. There are really nine steps, because one that he stressed that does not appear in the eight is right association. To understand that good health is as contagious as disease, as are virtue and cheerfulness. So the preliminary step is to associate with those whom you want to be like. Then step number one is right knowledge. Anything here would be an oversimplification. Let's just say that right knowledge is an understanding that what is right is natural for us. To follow our natural inclinations and seek truth in everything we do or say. To understand that we can overcome our difficulties by following the right path and by having an ongoing program of continuing education. Step number two is right aspiration. To make up our minds as to what our hearts really want. To get on course toward it and stay on course. Step number three is right speech. To watch what we say in the understanding that it is an indication of what sort of person we are. To try to speak the truth in everything we say and to say nothing that will not in some way help a situation or a person. To understand that our speech gives us away not just to others, but if we're wise, to ourselves. It reveals our true character and like anything else, it can probably stand some improvement. Step number four is right behavior. And this includes the five precepts, the Buddhist variation on the second or ethical half of the Ten Commandments. Do not kill. Strict Buddhists are vegetarians. Do not steal. Do not lie. Do not be unchaste. Do not drink intoxicants. Step number five is right livelihood. By this is meant to work at something which makes a positive contribution to society and is compatible with living the good life. Step number six is right effort. Buddha says, those who follow the way might well follow the example of an ox that marches through the deep mire carrying a heavy load. He is tired, but his steady gaze, looking forward, will never relax until he comes out of the mire, and it is only then he takes a respite. Step number seven is right mindfulness. No teacher ever credited the mind with more influence over life than did Buddha. The best loved of his texts, the Dhammapada opens with the words, All we are is the result of what we have thought. And step number eight is right absorption. That is, meditation until you have seen the truth, have received enlightenment. In fact, the word Buddha means enlightened one. His actual name was Siddhartha Gautama. He was born the son of a king and was, according to the legends, a strikingly handsome man who could have been a great king in his own right but he chose to redeem his world rather than rule it. The power of his teachings are evidenced by the fact that millions still live by them. I read in Manus about a paper by E.F. Schumacher entitled Modern Pressures and Environment in which it is recommended that we free our imagination from existing systems. I like that. We need to think in new directions. He writes, If still more education is to save us, it would have to be education of a somewhat different kind, an education that takes us into the depths of things and does not spend itself in an ever-extending battle with symptoms. The problem posed by environmental deterioration is not primarily a technical problem. If it were, it would not have arisen in its acutest form in the technologically most advanced societies. It does not stem from scientific or technical incompetence 
or from insufficient scientific education, or from a lack of information, or from any shortage of trained manpower, or lack of money for research. It stems from the lifestyle of the modern world, which in turn arises from its most basic beliefs, its metaphysics, if you like, or its religion. The whole of human life, it may be said, is a dialogue between man and his environment, a sequence of questions and responses. We pose questions to the universe by what we do, and the universe, by its response, informs us of whether our actions fit into its laws or not. Small transgressions evoke limited or mild responses. Large transgressions evoke general, threatening, and possibly violent responses. The very universality of the environmental crisis indicates the universality of our transgressions. It is the philosophy, or metaphysics, of materialism which is being challenged. And the challenge comes not from a few saints and sages, but from the environment. Now, this is a new situation. At all times, in all societies, in all parts of the world, the saints and sages have warned against materialism and pleaded for a more realistic order of priorities. The languages have differed, the symbols have varied, but the essential message has always been the same. In modern terms, get your priorities right. In Christian terms... Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things, the material things which you also need, shall be added unto you. They shall be added, we've always been told, added here on earth, where we need them, not simply in an afterlife beyond our imagination. Now, at issue here, Manus states, is whether or not nature, the universe, our environmental host, can speak in a language capable of being read in this way. Schumacher believes that it can. He says, today the same message reaches us from the universe itself. It speaks the language of pollution, exhaustion, breakdown, overpopulation, and also terrorism, genocide, drug addiction, and so forth. It is unlikely that the destructive forces which the materialist philosophy has unleashed can be brought under control simply by mobilizing more resources of wealth, education, and research to fight pollution, to preserve wildlife, to discover new sources of energy, and to arrive at more effective agreements on peaceful coexistence. I'm not real certain that he's correct about that. But he goes on to say that everything points to the fact that what is most needed today is a revision of the ends which all our efforts are meant to serve. And I'll certainly go along with that. And this implies that above all else, we need the development of a lifestyle which accords to material things their proper, legitimate place, which is secondary and not primary. The so-called logic of production is neither the logic of life nor that of society. It is a small and subservient part of both. Its destructive effects cannot be brought under control so that the destructive forces cease to be unleashed. The chance of mitigating the rate of resource depletion or of bringing harmony into the relationship between man and his environment is non-existent as long as there is no idea anywhere of a lifestyle which treats enough as good and more than enough as being of evil. And here lies the real challenge, and no amount of technical ingenuity can evade it. The environment, in its own language, is telling us that we are moving along the wrong path, and acceleration in the wrong direction will not put us right. When people call for moral choices in accordance with new values, this means nothing unless it means the overcoming of the materialistic lifestyle of the modern world and the reinstatement of some authentic moral teaching. And Mr. Schumacher turns now to the traditional four cardinal virtues— Prudence, justice, courage, and temperance, showing their application to the frenzied pattern of consumption which characterizes modern life. The fact is, as Manus points out, that habits of excess and waste have become reflexes in our daily life. Schumacher, in effect, is saying that we must learn thrift, conservation, reverence for the world, love for the earth, and another sort of respect for ourselves, not because supplies are running out all over, which they are, but because it is right to learn these things. And he's saying that we won't be able to do it without a philosophy that gives us reasons, for there are, after all, reasons which correspond to the instructions of the heart. The reasons arising from a sense of wholeness and synthesis are better than the reasons produced by analysis. In talking about the language of the environment, let me read something I wrote the other day in Mallorca, Spain. As I watched the sunset last night, I saw something that saddened and frightened me. The day had been perfectly clear. 
and at a quarter of seven, as the sun sank toward a great rocky promontory, there was not a cloud in the sky, but the sky was an ugly, murky brown. The horizon was invisible. It was obscured by a thick, opaque layer of pollution of man-made filth. There was not a seabird in the sky, nor had there been all day. The Mediterranean is a foul, nearly dead body of water, it appears. The only birds I've heard since landing in Spain, I wrote, were in cages at the Madrid airport, and it's the same in Naples, Genoa, Nice, Cannes, Barcelona. Man is in a dialogue with nature, and as Huxley once said in comparing life to a game of chess, those who play the game well are paid with the overflowing generosity with which the strong delight in strength. But those who play ill are checkmated without haste, but without remorse. Mankind is being checkmated, inexorably. His science and technology have not conquered nor tamed nature as he once thought. He has only been industriously digging his own grave. The planet can only respond to man through its reactions to his actions, and it is saying, I am dying. You are killing me. And when man finally succeeds in killing his generous and long-suffering host, he will discover that he has succeeded in killing himself. He has proved to be a brilliant but virulent species, and after he is gone, nature can begin again to clean his nest, and someday, probably surprisingly soon, the sunset over the Mediterranean will again be a thing of beauty. Incidentally, the pollution over the city of Madrid was as bad as any I, I have ever seen anywhere. It's as bad as it is in Johannesburg, South Africa, and Rome, and worse, I believe, than over most large American cities. Now, what can you and I do about the so-called materialist philosophy in the state of the world? I think we can start by re-evaluating our priorities and getting them in line with those of the rest of creation. My old friend Parky Parkinson of TWA used to make a speech he called The Tyranny of Junk, in which he urged us to clean house of all the junk we've collected, the basement, the attic, and every room in the house. Just get rid of it. Recycle it. We can begin to discriminate as to what we're going to purchase with our money. Practice thrift, on the one hand, and an avoidance of the continuing collection of junk on the other. We can develop and talk about a reverence for life, for the earth, and for each other. We can tell our kids, no, you can't buy that. Play with that mountain of toys you've already collected. Now, speaking out against materialism in our society is almost a kind of atheism. It's like being against mother and apple pie. And it isn't that we're against the technological industrial structure we've created. It's just that we want to relegate it to its proper place in the order of things. It shouldn't be in first place, not by a long shot. Now, in an earlier direct line, I quoted Mumford's suggestion that we make selective use of the best that our society has to offer by all means. But we can be very selective. Yesterday I was shopping in the grocery store and picked up a tube of shampoo since it was on my shopping list. When I saw the price stamped on it, I put it back and said to myself, I'll wash my hair with soap. There are so many things we can do without and still live well, even better. Now we want our great business establishment to flourish and wax profitable. We would like to see it extend its sales and distribution and effects to the four corners of the earth. But let us make it qualify for our business the hard way by producing a needed or much desired product of the very finest quality. Let's take home no more junk. Let's put ourselves and our kind and our earth and its creatures and beauty back into their proper places. I was reading of a proposal to put into orbit around the earth great reflectors to capture the sun's energy and send it to Earth by microwave. If the plan works, the Earth will have a free, non-polluting source of unlimited energy for at least the next three billion years, free at least at its source. It caused me to remember that there's always a way to what we need and want if we don't stop with early ideas and decisions and get stuck on them. There's not only a way to what we want, but a way that is exactly right and does not demand too great a trade-off. Now, fossil fuels now supply 97% of all the Earth's energy needs. That's practically all of it. In less than 100 years, our dependency on this convenient and heretofore abundant fuel supply has become all but totaled. Now it's running out, perhaps in the nick of time to save the biosphere from lethal doses of hydrocarbon pollution, and we must turn to new energy sources. As we find them, we will wonder at our long dependency on fossil fuels. 
Now, it's the same with us when we follow the dictates of the voice that speaks to us at quiet times, the voice that is our true selves trying to get through the artificial wall we work so hard to build around ourselves. When we have finally taken the steps we wanted for so long to take, we invariably say, why did I wait so long? What in the world was I afraid of? We tend to stop at partial solutions in almost everything we do. We get out of school, and as a rule, that our very partial and incomplete education suffice for the rest of our days. It's no wonder that so many millions are hanging on for dear life to the rudimentary and partial solutions they've managed to find for themselves. Eric Hopper, in his book, The True Believer, has told us that there is a conservatism of the very poor that's as rigid as that of the very rich. They fear any change in the belief that no matter how bad their present situation may be, any change at all might be a change for the worse. We might say the middle class seeks change in that it tends to be upwardly mobile, but change to the middle class consists of a series of quickly grasped stopgap measures based mainly on the direction of the economy. When I read of Edward G. Robinson's death, I learned for the first time that his lifelong motto had been to reach beyond his present grasp. Now, I don't recall the exact words. I should have written them down at the time. It wasn't that he was advocating living beyond our means. It was more a matter of recognizing just what the true extent of our real means are and challenging ourselves to reach more closely toward them. And each of us has a voice bidding him to follow the way that is right for him. That voice is what the ancient Greeks called our soul, the real person lurking behind the facade we present to the world. I think that's why meditation is such a good and constructive practice. When we sit and quietly meditate, clear our minds of all cares, we let that quiet voice come through. Not at first, perhaps, but with a little practice it'll come. Very few people in the Western world meditate, and they often cut themselves off from their true selves by not following this ancient and enlightening practice. Perhaps it's in our childhood that we learn to settle for less than we could really achieve. How does that land go? Men are made into slaves, not by heredity but by the habits bred into them in their youth? We learn as youngsters that it's all right to settle for a passing grade. It's good enough becomes our slogan. And then we find ourselves applying it's good enough to more important things like a job, income, home, neighborhood. Do you like your work? Oh, it's good enough. It's okay. The earth should not be relying for 97% of its power needs on fossil fuels, the happy accidental residue of prehistoric times. And we will see the move over the next 50 years to new, cleaner, more efficient, more effective, cheaper, and longer-lasting sources of energy. Deuterium from seawater, the harnessing of hydrogen and solar energy. The use of fossil fuel will become a fossil of history, a brief step up from the horse to the automobile and the jet airplane. But for a while, we thought we'd found the answer to man's power needs forever. During the lives of most of us, we'll see the thick, ugly pall of pollution removed forever from the skies and the return of clear sunlight, clean rain and snow, and fresh, breathable air. But how many of us have stopped too soon, too, in our own lives? <laughs> 